contents of them are, um, in some cases, astonishing. Um, you know, we get some really intimate details about the Roosevelt family. We get lots of details about politics in New York at the time. Uh, and, and, you know, some, some quirky stuff too, like, you know, what, what food was on the menu at Sagamore <laughs> Hill or what games did they play as kids, you know, yeah. and how do they describe them? And you, you guys know audio is such a richer, um, medium than writing. I mean, there's things that you can only convey in writing that you can't do in audio, but the voice to hear people's voices just brought everything alive for me. Hello and welcome to the Talk About Teddy podcast, our conversations exploring the world of Theodore Roosevelt. I'm your host, Kurt Skinner, and I'm joined as ever by my good pal and co-host, Larry Marple. And today we continue our discussion with Professor Michael Patrick Cullinane. And you can find our last conversation with him at episode 13 of the podcast when we discussed his book, Theodore Roosevelt's Ghost, The History and Memory of an American Icon. His follow-up book, published in 2021, is entitled Remembering Theodore Roosevelt, Reminiscences of His Contemporaries. Using oral histories conducted by the Theodore Roosevelt Association and Columbia University in the 1950s, in addition to recently discovered and digitized recordings of Roosevelt friends and family members, Professor Cullinane has broadened our understanding by providing a more nuanced exploration of the world of Theodore Roosevelt. Professor Cullinane is the Loman Walton Chair of Theodore Roosevelt Studies at Dickinson State University, and he also serves as the public historian of the Theodore Roosevelt Association and is contributing to the curation of the Theodore Roosevelt Presidential Library and Museum, which will open to the public in July 2026. Dr. Michael Colony, welcome back to the Talk About Teddy podcast. We're delighted to have you with us to talk about your book, Remembering Theodore Roosevelt. Go round two. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, I was wondering if you uh, could talk to our listeners about how is it that you stumble into this um, historical researcher's mm -hmm. dream of coming across undiscovered oh. manuscripts and recordings having yeah. to do with the world of Theodore Roosevelt. Yeah, so it's it's luck, really. I mean, as it as it would happen, um, I was looking through a collection of transcripts at Columbia University, an oral history archive that was made by Herman Hagedorn and his daughter Mary, uh, along with the Theodore Roosevelt Association and um, dozens of other people who were the interviewees. And uh, these are all transcripts that are available that many researchers have looked at in the past. And I was talking then at an event in 2017 or 2018 with Susan Sarna, who is uh, formerly of Sagamore Hill, the uh, chief curator there. She's now at the Theodore Roosevelt Presidential Library as the senior collections curator there. And Sue is, uh, she knows just about everything there is to know about the archives and the collections and the objects that, you know, we associate with TR. And she said to me, oh, yeah, I think there's some recordings in mm. the birthplace. Um, and she goes, we've gotten some extra transcripts from the birthplaces in we, Sagamore Hill. Um, and she said, but I think there's still audio recordings there. And I said, well, when I was there last, I said I never saw them or heard them for that matter. And she goes, yeah, you know, they're kind of in a safe somewhere. And anyway, I talked to the National Park Service staff about those recordings and um, there's no way to play them because they are on seven or eight inch magnetic reels. And mm -hmm. those reels have been there since 1954 in most cases, maybe 1955 for a couple of others. And they, they had on them approximately seven or eight hours of recordings with people like Alice Roosevelt Longworth, who if you ever get to listen to her voice, mm -hmm. you know, she sounds like Catherine Hepburn on speed. <laughs> uh, and there's others, too. There's other great family members like um, William Sheffield Coles Jr. and his wife, Bobby. Um, there are uh, political acolytes of Theodore Roosevelt, like um, Stanley Isaacs, who is a New York City councilman for a n number of years. And then these, these recordings, no one had listened to since probably the 1950s. And there's good reason for that. Um, a, there's the, the format that they're in, these magnetic reels, right? The National Park Service, when they take over the birthplace in 1963, it's around the time when they're getting rid of those kind of players and they move to cassettes. 
So the technology just goes from magnetic reels to cassettes to CDs onto now digital, right? So that means that they never had the players at the site to play the magnetic reels. And I went back and spoke to rangers that were there since 1972, and wow. none of them had ever heard the recordings. And to be sure of this as well, I talked to a lot of historians that would have been in the birthplace and used the archives. I asked people like uh, Kathleen Dalton. I talked to people that had worked with uh, Edmund Morris, who was, spent a lot of time at the birthplace. He never listened to these reels. I talked to Stacy Cordry, who wrote the best biography on Alice Roosevelt Longworth, and she, she never listened to them either. Yeah. So um, I was pretty confident that no one had heard them before. And the contents of them are, um, in some cases, astonishing. Um, you know, we get some really intimate details about the Roosevelt family. Mm -hmm. We get lots of details about politics in New York at the time. Uh, and, and, you know, some, some quirky stuff too, like, you know, what, what food was on the menu at Sagamore <laughs> Hill or what games did they play as kids, you know, yeah. and how do they describe them? And you, you guys know audio is such a richer, um, medium than writing. I mean, there's things that you can only convey in writing that you can't do in audio, but the voice to hear people's voices just brought everything alive for me. Well, your subtitle here of remembering Theodore Roosevelt is reminiscences of his contemporaries. So by mm -hmm. by the 1950s, when Hagedorn and, and his daughter Mary are conducting these uh, oral history interviews, you've already had the death of his wife, Edith. Uh, you've had yeah. already the death in the 1930s of his sisters, um, Bammy and Corrine. Uh, so who are the contemporaries here that uh, that – Hagedorn and his daughter are interviewing. So Alice Roosevelt Longworth is as close as it gets in terms of, uh, uh, you know, being TR's daughter. Uh, but his nephew, William Sheffield Coles, is a really mm -hmm. great, uh, really great person to get interviewed because he doesn't just connect with Theodore Roosevelt, but obviously he's the Roosevelt's sister's son. Uh, that's Bammy or mm -hmm. Anna Roosevelt Coles. And, um, but he connects also with Franklin Roosevelt as well, as does Alice Roosevelt Longworth and others. But, you know, William Sheffield Coles talks a lot about how Franklin Roosevelt looked up to Theodore Roosevelt. And the stories that you get about this are, you know, he would have been an aide to Franklin Roosevelt when he was secretary of the Navy at the end of World War One. He, he even goes over to Versailles with Franklin Roosevelt. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's a it's a proximity to power, I think, here with all of this. So. Um, another example might be Stanley Isaacs, who, uh, you know, is a is a political acolyte of, of TRs. You know, he goes on to have this great career and he talks about the legacy that Roosevelt left him just by meeting him a couple of times. So there's like really close family friends or fam family members. And yeah. then there's there's like not, I wouldn't say a close, but like, you know, acquaintances, but from the same time period. And what you do get to see is the through line of ideology, political ideology from Theodore Roosevelt to later generations. Because people like Isaacs, for example, are, he's in politics until the late 60s, early 70s. Yeah. So we have a long time span there. We also have, you know, varying different political issues and varying different uh, interpretations of, of, of TR. You know, so there's, you know, there's some people yeah. that say, oh, TR would have um, would have wanted things to happen this way. Other people say he would have wanted them to happen another way. This, in a way, this was a an addendum to the first book, Theodore Roosevelt's Ghost, yeah. because this is straight from the horse's mouth. If Theodore Roosevelt's Ghost is 100 years of memory and legacy, these are the people that actually knew him and are talking about him uh, in the 1950s. So, I mean, it's, it's an important book to me in the sense that uh, you get it from the horse's mouth here. These yeah. are people that actually knew TR and, and were talking about their time with him. Yeah, I know the impetus behind the recordings was Herman Hagedorn, and we mentioned in the previous podcast about his importance in preserving TR's legacy. Where did he get the idea for the recordings? Well, interestingly, Hagedorn had always wanted to collect oral histories. That was the first mm -hmm. thing that he wanted to do. And actually, it's something that I would encourage, you know, you guys are both educators. One of the ways that I got into history in the first instance was speaking to my grandfather about his experiences during World War yeah. II and the Great Depression. And I think there's a powerful connection between, and there's something that happens in you too as a, as a questioner. I mean, you guys ask questions all the time as a podcaster and as a teacher, mm -hmm. but 
I don't know, does everyone get that opportunity to ask people questions like what interests you? And Hagedorn mm-hmm. was exceptionally mm-hmm. good at that. And he was putting his own imprint on, on people. Now, as I said, he wanted to collect oral histories all the way back in 1919 when TR dies. He wants to do it in Long Island. And the people in Long Island don't want to do it with him. <laughs> so he goes out to the Badlands in 1919. And he, his inspiration for the book, TR and the Badlands, is from a bunch of oral histories yeah. that he did out in with friends of TR in 1919. And he never lost that spirit, that idea of interviewing people that knew TR. So when it came to the 1950s and the Centennial Project, which was the centennial of TR, TR's birth, mm-hmm. Hagedorn had said, well, you know, I mean, I've collected everything. I'd still like to collect more oral histories. Mm-hmm. And so he starts talking to everyone that he possibly can about TR. And at this stage, I mean, many of them have died off. Many of TR's closest political allies and family members and friends. So Hagedorn realizes this is kind of the last gasp of TR's contemporaries, and he tries his very best to get as many as he can. And there are more uh, that are not, you know, that are not just recorded. Uh, there, there are many more that are in transcripts in, in the Columbia Oral History Collection. Um, but all of them are, are really, um, they're all included there because he, he recognized that oral history was important. And I should just say, on a side note here, oral history was becoming more and more important by the 1940s and 50s as well. The first yeah. A uh, major, a really important center for oral history uh, study was in Columbia University, and it was Alan Evans, famous American professor of history, and he and Hagedorn knew each other, and they had talked at one stage. And at one point, actually, I think Hagedorn had expected that these oral histories would be much more extensive. Uh, so this is a professional practice as well. In fact, it's so professional that Hagedorn encourages his daughter to get an MA in the oral history program in Columbia as well. So this is something that was, um, the circumstances led to it, but also it's very much part of Hagedorn's love affair with oral history. I used to actually assign that to my students as a weekend assignment. I said, go find somebody old and just talk to them. Ask them some questions. Yeah, they're going to repeat themselves sometimes, but just astonishing, um, (laughs) you know, once you get them talking. And one of my favorite uh, quotes, I, I can't recall who it is, but they said the the past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. So some of these tra- these interviews, the Hagedorns were asking people to recall events perhaps 30, 40, 50 years in the past, which is a is an amazing thing to have to try to do. But the the level of detail that some of these folks can still conjure up about TR. Could you speak to some of the revelations that come across about Theodore Roosevelt. Yeah, about TR, there's there's quite a few. I mean, one of my favorite interviews, and this isn't in the recordings, but it's in one of the transcripts, is from a North Dakota and a guy called Jesse Langdon, who mm-hmm. is one of the last chapters in the book. And Jesse Langdon is a very colorful character. And <laughs> one of the things that you have to ask yourself when you're when you're reading some of these or listening to them is, are they true? Uh, you know, these are, as you pointed out, people's memories and people's memories are, are flawed. I mean, eyewitness testimony in a court doesn't always hold up. So some of these stories seem like fishermen's tales and they just get longer and bigger, the fish, right? Um, Jesse Langdon was a rough rider. That much we know is true. He says he, he was the first one, uh, the first rough rider ever sworn in. Um, he says that because Rough Riders weren't sworn in. So I guess in theory, he was the first one sworn in and the last one sworn out because he actually was sworn out in a sense. So, uh, But he's a real storyteller and he talks about his travels from North Dakota to Washington, D.C. to uh, enroll as a volunteer in the Rough Rider, Rough Rider Regiment. And he actually stumbles upon Theodore Roosevelt and off the steps of the uh, Navy War and State Building and uh, and... It's at that stage that he asks him to join, and, and he does. But his his travels from North Dakota to Washington are incredible. And his travels then with Theodore Roosevelt to San Antonio and Tampa and, and Cuba are, are equally fascinating, and they really are an insider's history of the Rough Riders. The problem is, too, with memory is that he's forged those memories and those stories, some of which are just, you know, brilliant. But he's forged them with a bunch of other guys who've been retelling those stories at Rough Rider reunions over 40 years, too. So, you know, those fishermen's tales, they 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 sort of it's like a collective memory in a way. Mm -hmm. Um, 
anyway, I, I still think they're worthy. They're worthy to to to, to listen to and, and to to read. But I think we need to take everything with a sort of a grain of salt and make yeah. sure that we're we're aware that some of them might be exaggerated. Um, now that said, there's other stories in there about Theodore Roosevelt and his politics, like for example, who he wanted to succeed him. Yeah. So William Chadbourne, one of the, uh, the the people in the book, who was a Republican uh, Party leader in New York, said that it was Elihu Root, and I think mm-hmm. that's confirmed by a bunch of other historians as well. But he talks about how much he he wanted Elihu Root to be the next president, but that Elihu Root was so cold and uh, icy that he, he would have never been elected. And he was he was an introvert, and he was a lawyer, and he, you know yeah. he wasn't a charismatic political leader of men. Mm -hmm. Um, so he settles on Taft, but there's some other great stories in there as well about TR and meeting college students, which is something TR loved to do, but there's some intimate stories about what happened in in colleges when, you know, TR would meet students. He would say that no one's allowed to talk about what they're going to discuss. And he, he just thought the world of college students, but, you know, people going off and getting a liberal arts education made them critical thinkers and able to you know, parse life's biggest problems. And he, he talks to a number of college students in one of these interviews uh, with a, a former Harvard man. And, um, and you know, he really just thought the world of college students. Another, another really good one is uh, he meets someone who's a Democrat and uh, he, someone says, oh, this, this guy's from Tammany Hall. And Roosevelt says, don't, don't take him down a peg or two because he's a Democrat. You know, what's important is that he's got belief in his convictions. Yeah. And that kind of shuts up the other guy who's kind of trying to put him down for being a Democrat. It just there's little glimpses at Theodore Roosevelt's personality in all of these stories that give you a much better sense of the man than some of our uh, more traditional biographies, I think. Yeah. yeah, that's the really interesting thing. Well, it's it's the real value of, of this book is that it, it adds more layers to TR's character to glimpses into his personality uh, that you you mentioned the good government clubs of, of college students that came to the White House and, and the recollection of that conversation and and yeah that that kid was so um, was so moved that that TR didn't dismiss him uh, as as a Democrat that that he said no it's it's just important that you that you stand for your convictions that you get yeah. involved in civic life in America and uh, yeah, and same with with Jesse Langdon, you know, the the Rough Rider. It was seventy some years yeah. later that he still recalled conversations he said with Roosevelt. That, I mean, he, he talks about how Roosevelt was such a good listener that he listened to the common man. He had that common touch with people, um, and you know that those are just tremendous. Those of us who love Theodore Roosevelt, that's, yeah. these are just amazing little morsels that that give a little bit more insight into his his character and personality and that that's priceless so thank you so much for digging that out yeah you can read the interviews in your book and you've mentioned in other podcasts and places that the recordings themselves are available to be listened to so you can hear alice's voice you can catch the intonations where can we find those recordings yeah, good question. So what what happened when this project began um, was that we weren't sure if we were going to be able to digitize these mm-hmm. magnetic reels. But the National Park Service was really great. And they basically I, I said to them, I'll pay for the digitization if you can if you can help me get it to New York City. Uh, there's, a, there's a great place called DataWorks in New York City that digitized these. And one of the, the park rangers basically walked over the assets, these these magnetic reels. And then got them digitized, and they, the, the National Park Service said, "You own them now, Mike." And I was like, "Well, you know, I don't want to own them. I mean, these I want everyone to listen to these. So yeah. you can reach out to the Park Service. I've made them public domain now, so Good. you can listen to them. Reach out to the birthplace, the, the Manhattan sites of the National Park Service, and uh, the curator there will be able to put you in the right direction. Or if you can't find it that way, you can always email me, and I'll, you know, I'll." I don't have any links online to them, but yeah. I have all the recordings and they're, they're free to use. So, yeah, I mean, I think if you are intrepid and you, you do want to hear more of TR, if you certainly a lot of people want to hear Alice Roosevelt Longworth because, you know, <laughs> she's got such a unique place in American history. Um, yeah, you, you know, go and listen to them. There's hours and hours there. Yeah. Several of these interviewees speak to 
uh, Roosevelt's memory. Could you give an example of, uh, I think it was the uh, when he had just welcomed back the Great White Fleet, and he's he's on board the the gunship of of the admiral and and he spots somebody uh, out <laughs> up on one of the the gun turrets could you t- speak to that <laughs> that's one of the big things that comes out of the book is that theodore roosevelt's memory was incredible i mean yeah. photo- photographic is almost like an understatement okay so um there's this obviously the great white fleet, fleet coming home is a crowning achievement to tr's presidency mm-hmm. and there is a huge amount of pomp and circumstance with this so one of the ad, the admirals the the flagship is got 700 sailors on it you know of mm-hmm. all different rank and tr is there to welcome them back and to to greet the ship and he's on the, the deck of the ship and he spots someone up in the gun turret you know one of the 700 sailors there and asks uh you know asks him to come down, you know, and basically says, I know you and you're so-and-so and and I wanted to thank you for the loving (laughs) cup that you had presented, you know, at one stage and the sailor is just gobsmacked, you know, how, how could you possibly remember me, let alone pick me out in a crowd of all sailors in, in largely the same uniforms. And this isn't the only occasion either. There's another time when TR is driving through New York, um, I can't remember the circumstances of the trip, but he's driving through New York and he's basically being chauffeured from A to B. And he often had police escorts for, mm-hmm. for that because obviously he had been nearly assassinated once before. Um, and one of the escorts there is a man that he had promoted from all the way back when he was police commissioner in New York. And now it's post-presidency. And he turns to the guy and he says, so-and-so, how come you didn't say hello to me? And he says, well, I'm sorry, sir. I didn't think you would you would notice me. And he says, well, didn't I make you a sergeant? Yep. And he goes, yes, sir, you did, you know, and <laughs> I'm very sorry for not, you know. But I mean, these are these are wonderful stories that I think speak to the humanity of Roosevelt, which yeah. I mean, so uh, obviously I, I think Roosevelt's a great leader, right, on many levels. But yeah. being able to have a photographic memory and then to to speak to people with a with an empathy and compassion from their perspective and, and to try and relate to them is something that he seems to do throughout his career. And what these stories in the book explain is that he's able to do that because he, his memory is just so darn good. You know, he can pull things yeah. from books that he read ages ago. So someone that he might be speaking with, you know, is aware that he's this very busy man, leader of men, is, has also read this book and is engaging with them on yeah. a topic that they're also fond of. So, I mean... The whole book is riddled with stories like that. But uh, for me, it's it's one of those things that makes him a very human character. Maybe superhuman, actually, is the right way. Yeah. Because, I mean, no one no one really has a memory like that that I know. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, two to three books a day and then being able to cite page numbers years later in answer yeah. to questions is pretty amazing. And one of the yeah. things I love with your book you just mentioned is how when you read the interviews, it gives TR flesh and blood. It's the real TR, the people that met him, not just rose-colored glasses through a biographer. You know, you get Jacob Rees um, and others who write about him, but you get those who were right there and knew him. There was one interview that I wish was longer. I wish it would, would have went on and on, and that is uh, uh, Barkley Farr, who was a uh, a classmate of, of Kermit's at Groton. And uh, he... You and you entitle this. You take it actually from something that Tr had had said uh, to the kid's mom. But <laughs> it's called the worst friend of the worst boy in the world. <laughs> so uh, he had this unique uh, opportunity to see Roosevelt as a relaxed family man at Sagamore Hill. Could, do you remember a couple of stories, that, particularly like Fourth of July stories that? that he yeah. recollects. Yeah, I mean, that that one is actually probably my favorite. I mean, the Barkley Farr. So Barkley Farr, actually, there's two stories from the same fam, well, from, uh, family members in there. So Barkley Farr and his wife, Georgina Farr Sibley, is also featured in there as well. So mm-hmm. they were family friends through um, Ethel Roosevelt Darby and through Kermit Roosevelt. And they actually lived next door to Corrine Roosevelt Robinson, who was TR's sister. There's a couple of stories. My favorite one, and I'll tell the 4th of July story too, but my favorite one is when Barkley Farr plays tennis with Theodore Roosevelt at Sagamore (laughs) Hill because they had a grass court at Sagamore Hill. And Theodore Roosevelt, man, he did not play tennis like 
Pete Sampras or Novak Djokovic. I mean, he yeah. was just running around the court like a maniac. And Barkley Farr, when he gets to play tennis with him, he's terrified because TR is president <laughs> at that stage. And he thinks to himself, okay, I'm playing doubles with this guy. And he's on his team and he serves and he nearly hits TR. He thinks, oh, God, I'm going to. I'm going to hit the president with a tennis ball, you know, hard probably. And, uh, and TR loves this. He's just yeah. so elated with the, the game and the play and the banter. Um, and it is kind of, in a way, it gives you a sense of TR's um, his kind of view on life, you know, that yeah. it's a, it's, it's all a bit of a laugh. I mean, it's serious too, but I mean, when you're out to play, it's out for fun and, yeah. and nothing more. But he, he also, um, the thing that I really love about TR is a father. I'm a father of two boys. And I, I think I've learned a lot from this book in terms of how to be a father because his kids get into lots of trouble. Like if you if you oh, think yeah. that the Roosevelt family didn't get into trouble, I mean, come on, every family, mm. every kid does something stupid at some stage. And and TR's kids, Kermit Roosevelt and Barkley Farr, on the Fourth of July, they go out to stir up some trouble, and they're they're going to go torment a neighbor with fireworks. And so they go over there, and it's kind of raining out, and they've got some sort of explosive of some kind, yeah. you know. I don't know what kind of M80s there were back in the day, but <laughs> they go out and they're going to they're going to light some fireworks off on this guy's porch. And they they start doing that. And the guy pulls a gun on them and they've got to run and they tumble down, you know, um, tumble down uh, banks. And they, they have to make their way back you know, a couple miles to Sagamore <laughs> Hill. And, and the guy, of course, his door, when the fireworks went off, the door burned. Yeah. And then he's, he has he, the guy, the neighbor goes over to TR's house and says, look, your kids burned my door. And the kids are, you know, they're in trouble, but TR never yells at them. I mean, that to no. me is incredible. I mean, I, I yell at my kids for far less than that. <laughs> yeah. But uh, And there's other stories that Barkley Farr and others have in the White House where it's the same. You know, TR is, is laughing at them, boys being boys and girls being girls in other cases, too. But yeah. it's just he takes it in his stride, which is um, remarkably, um, yeah, remarkably chilled out, I guess, as a dad. I think he, he remarks about how you know Roosevelt never scolded them. Um, I, I think he, I, I think he did say he may have spoken to Kermit later. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I know yeah. in the White House he spoke to him, the boys with the White House gang at times, but nothing. You don't ever hear him, like you said, yelling at them. I'm, I can't recall which uh, interviewee it was, but they they talked about um, uh, again Roosevelt with family life at Sagamore. Um, it's fairly well known that he couldn't carry a tune and yet he would yeah. use this as a form of uh getting people to laugh and, and entertainment uh that he would sing opera at, at home yeah. for amusement yep. of others <laughs> yeah there's um i think the the home life stuff is fascinating the singing the the charade you know charades and the messing around the house the also the way that edith kind of was edith was a very different character to tr so tr was uh, rather jovial, Edith, I, I wouldn't say it was stern, maybe borderline stern, but she was serious, you know? Yeah. Um, I think naturally they were they were very much in love with each other, but she also told him things that he didn't want to hear sometimes. Like there's an episode in one of the recordings where um, someone's describing TR getting carving a roast dinner on Sunday and getting gravy all over his shirt, and Edith says something along the lines of, you're going to have to go change your shirt now because we have the senators coming over later, and he says, well, the senator can just deal with this. I've got gravy on my shirt. No, you know, <laughs> and, you know, those kind of family moments, those intimate moments and, and the kind of trivial ones too, the ones that we think don't matter. I mean, they are, they are, they speak to the, the person and the character and their relationships yeah. too. And, and those relationships are, I mean, TR with his family is a, is a love that is, um, it, it's really remarkable. I know Ed O'Keefe has got yeah. a book coming out about the loves of TR's life, you know, yeah. And it's mainly the women. But I think that family love is really comes through in these testimonials as well. The accounts of how the Roosevelt family got along. And there's mm. there's something in there beyond just the immediate family. In every one of those interviews, the Roosevelt family uses the word devotion. Yeah. They were devoted to each other. And that's a lovely way to think about family love and, you know, the, the shared experiences that we have as family. Yeah. One of the things I really love about your book is, it stresses the importance of the Roosevelt women. It, you know, puts Ethel in there, which she gets overlooked a lot because of Alice's reputation and the other Washington Monument stature. And you've got 
you know, all the different people there, that the ladies. It, it gives a good perspective. It's like if you want to understand T.R. more, look at the women in his life. It's what my wife Julia has talked about when she portrays Edith reading the biographies of T.R., but then reading Sylvia Jukes Morris, and you get such a different view and perspective of T.R. So, Absolutely. We recently had the opportunity to um, have an interview with Ed O'Keefe talking about the upcoming book, Loves of yeah. Theodore Roosevelt, and he does use your book uh, a, yeah. a bit, uh, the reminiscences of people are in the orbit of, of Theodore Roosevelt. And uh, that's something else that touches the women of Roosevelt's life in this book. A bit of folks um, comment on his sisters. So we hear quite a lot about the character of, of his sister, Bammy, and also Kareen. Kareen and, and Bammy are, uh, and this is another thing just about the names, just quickly, and this is completely aside, but I always thought it was pronounced Kareen. Mm -hmm. uh, but actually what you hear on the recordings is how they actually pronounce their names. So it's pronounced Kareen. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and so anyway, Kareen and, and, and Bammy are incredibly important forces, and they're very different women as well. Alice Roosevelt says in the recordings that if Bammy, the oldest sister, if she hadn't been a woman, she would have been president of the United States, not, her, not, not Theodore. Um, so she had this very powerful vision for the family, strong convictions, yeah. but also uh, this indomitable spirit and charisma as well. Corrine, on the other hand, is much more sensitive, emotive, um, I suppose, um, tender as well. You know, some, <laughs> someone called her in the recordings uh, sickeningly sweet, that she's so, so pleasant. But she wasn't this kind of like, you know, charismatic leader. And both of those two personalities certainly filter into TR as well. I mean, yeah. these, these women are his champions throughout his life, you know, always kind of always feeling fulfilled when they're with him, when they're, when they're talking for him or, or vying for him. So they're incredibly important. Bammy is just such a character in this book because her son, William Sheffield Coles, her only son, uh, speaks quite a bit about her and about her life and what dinner parties were like with her. She was very hard of hearing, and yet the whole room kind of revolved around this cadence that she kept with, yep. uh, you know, telling telling wonderful stories, bringing people together then at the end of the meal and how that all worked. And yeah. you know, they talk about her last day uh, alive and, and she was still bringing people into the house to have tea because it was like part of the ritual, even though she could barely dress herself. She didn't dress herself. Someone was dressing her. And, you know, but these women are just incredible characters in their own right. And Ed's book does a wonderful job of, of bringing that out. What What I like best about Ed's book as well is about his mother and his treatment of Mitty yeah. Bullock, uh, who in so many books is reduced to like a Victorian caricature of an over-civilized woman, you know, someone who doesn't really um, take a leading role in her family. And Ed's book puts that absolutely right and makes Mitty a major character. And there are, there are some uh, chapters in the book, my book, that talk about Mitty and her family and the women mm -hmm. uh, like the Gracie family, you know, the her si yeah. Mitty's sisters that are just... Um, you know, they're so important to the development of, of TR, but also everyone else in the family owes a major debt of gratitude to all of the women. Yeah. When you were listening to the tapes and transcribing, doing all the work, how did it transform your understanding of TR? That's a great question. Oh, wow. I don't know did, did that much change in terms of my impression, because I, I feel like I've been living with TR for a long time now. I'm actually, I'm like, I need a break from TR. I know my wife definitely wants a break from TR. If she has to hear me talk about TR anymore, she's going to freak out. But I, I don't think my overall impression has changed terribly. What I do like are the stories that, that bring out his human side and his sort of mm -hmm. like the day-to-day -day stuff that I you probably don't think of. When you read biographies of TR, you know, you're going to get like the anthracite coal strike and World War One and everything's really heavy and big and demanding of your attention, but like what they ate at Sagamore Hill, yeah. that's kind of cool. And that I'm, you know, I'm really interested in all that, not to write a book about it necessarily, but just to get a better sense of what was going on in the periphery of TR's life. And I think yeah. you get that out of the book, a little bit more of the periphery. 
Well, we know that you need to be going on to your next pursuit. Uh, Michael, we were going to ask you one more question here. I understand you are working on uh, one more Theodore Roosevelt project, perhaps, before you move on to to other fields. So could you just uh, mention what you're working on currently? So this one is about Theodore Roosevelt and the sort of unsung heroes of his administration. So we mentioned that TR played tennis. It was his favorite sport. He had a tennis court outside of the president's office. Um, this is the, the original West Wing. Yeah. It was built by TR, and his wife put in a tennis court so that he would get exercise. On that tennis court, kind of court is a double entendre here in the sense that it was a court in the tennis sense, but it was also a court where you know the big ideas of the administration were thrashed out. Yeah. And the 30 or so members of that court were really important figures that have been almost completely overlooked by historians because TR is this great vacuum that sucks all of the air out of the room. But actually, <laughs> yeah. you know, he could have never gotten the things done without some of these, these guys. And um, so I wanted to elevate their status a little bit while also telling the story of TR's presidency. And so the book is about uh, the presidency from their perspective, but what you'll get from the book is uh, a sense of all the achievements of the white house years, which I think, Actually, we spend a lot of time talking about TR and adventure and mm-hmm. TR and action, but actually TR and politics is something that we, we could dwell a little bit on more, especially for our own time. I think he got a lot done as president. And for me, how he got that done is yeah. almost as important as, as what he got done. We'll Good. look forward to that next layer of remembering legacy of Theodore Roosevelt. So. Uh, Michael Patrick Colonine, thank you so much for sharing your time here. We really yeah. appreciate this opportunity to talk to you. Thank you. Yeah. Larry, Kurt, thanks so much. I cannot wait to see you guys in Indiana, and we will talk more about Roosevelt, I'm sure. Wow, what an amazing asset to the Theodore Roosevelt community. I think Larry and I speak for TED Heads out there when we say, Michael, we can't wait for the next book. Uh, We encourage you all to check out his podcast, The Gilded Age and Progressive Era, and you can follow his activities at his website, michaelpatrickcullinane.com. If you want to listen to the newly digitized interviews converted from the 1950s magnetic tapes that Professor Cullinane referenced in this episode, they're now available at the nps.gov Theodore Roosevelt Birthplace website. We'll have a link to those on our podcast website as well, talkaboutteddy.com. Well, that's our show for today. Thanks for listening. You can find this podcast on our website, talkabouttedy.com. Dot com, where you can see show notes and transcripts, links to resources, and additional TR content. And please, tell us what you think. If you've enjoyed our content, please consider subscribing and reviewing the podcast wherever you listen, and tell your friends and family about us, because it really does make a tremendous difference, and it helps others find this show. We hope you'll join us for the next episode of Talk About Teddy. And until then, as our friend Colonel Roosevelt would say... Do what you can with what you have, where you are. Bullet. <laughs>